Hey everyone, this is Monica Michelle with Explicitly Sick on the Invisible Not Broken Network. And this podcast is going to be all about just chatting about life with disability and chronic illness. I'll be interviewing authors and artists and business owners and people just with different disabilities. So this is part two of my interview with Sarah Ramy. If you have not heard part one, please head on back and listen um, if you'd like. Uh, part one is where we really talk a lot about her book, um, which is amazing and fantastic. And please go to our show notes at invisiblenotbroken.com. And at the very top of um, the explicitly six section, you will see this wonderful post. And um, at the very top, you will see um, a place to purchase her book, uh, The Lady's Handbook. For Her Mysterious Illness. Um, it's a fantastic book. Please go over there. Uh, this week, we are covering um, the process of writing while you have a chronic illness. And we talk about uh, parenting on my side with chronic illness. Uh, we get very into gardening. And uh, we have a whole discussion on silver linings and how people around us and how maybe we ourselves um, can learn how to talk to someone who has told us some news that we are not necessarily ready to hear or are saddened by or upset by about the other person's life. So basically learning how to just hold space. Um, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, we also do go a little bit into Outlander. So if that is your thing, I hope you enjoy. We, we've um, had a lot of fun chatting about all of our, our various literary interests. Um, I'm going to stop talking now. Please enjoy this interview with Sarah Ramy. But I hear you because I feel yeah. like there's there's so many of us who are compassionate but aren't taught the right language. Like I'm still learning the right language. I, I have a lot of very compassionate listeners who will, most of them call me out kindly on when I screw mm-hmm. up and I, I have left someone out or I have, um, I've said something that I did not mean, I certainly never mean to be offensive unless I'm mm-hmm. talking about people who don't want myself to exist or others to exist based on mm-hmm. our birth. Um, otherwise, mm-hmm. I don't mean to be, but I feel like we're we're all sort of like, being pit against each other in some sort of weird purity test on like how how perfect can we understand everyone even those we have not met yet that we're still learning about and I think that's mm-hmm. very um like more more walls are being thrown up in this purity test than are being taken down mm-hmm. yeah I think that that's true and to your audience if I'm being horrible and offensive I <laughs> super apologize I, just, I am also learning and I, I yeah I just you know, I really, I'm, it's funny, I'm going from this time of like, like a very protracted period of isolation and not being around people to like suddenly being like very connected to a lot of people. And I'm like, this is not gonna, this is not gonna go well. <laughs> I always <laughs> oh, sorry. Like, myself in my room and it's probably not gonna go so well. And it's like, I didn't feel like, and so I just have like, you know, fortified myself for like, <laughs> getting it wrong because I, I know that I know that for sure like because because and it's just that's a, this is just another thing is that I personally whatever I like think and believe I am not somebody that's like here is what I think and believe and it's written <laughs> sharply and it is true like that's not how I think about anything I feel like everything for me is like written in pencil <laughs> and it's like always up for revision because <laughs> you know, what do I know? <laughs> so, I, I go with Jane Austen. I have no talent for certainty. Yeah, that's good. Like, <laughs> yeah. What is that? Like, uh, beliefs are dangerous. Ideas are good. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, oh gosh, Kevin Smith's um, Dogma. Mm. Very weird, very good, strange movie. And uh, Carlin as the Pope is probably my favorite casting choice. Alanis Morissette as God was awesome. <laughs> oh, I've seen that. I have seen that. I remember Alanis Morissette as God. <laughs> yeah. If you're sick long enough, you become sort of a pop culture. Uh, yeah. I can get all the references on RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> I just want to do a quick energy check with you because I I, I will keep you talking forever. I, I am lonely and I will, I will talk to you all day. So I just want to make sure that you're still doing okay before I continue on to another topic. Yeah, I'm doing okay. And also, same for you. Like, if you need to wrap up, you wrap up whenever you <laughs> I will let you know, but um, this is just way too much fun for me. So I'm sorry. I just <laughs> tell me to stop kidnapping you. I will not charge a ransom. No, no, You're fine. fine. Okay. Oh um, I, I am a writer as well, um, but I write fiction. And I was so curious with brain fog and chronic pain. How did you finish a book? <laughs> well, I literally started it. I mean, I... The, the first 12 pages of the book I wrote in in uh, 
2005. <laughs> and so okay, I feel I, so much better. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so it took so long. So I also, I sold the book. I started writing the book proposal in 2008. I mean, well, I'll just say this again. So I sold it. I started in 2008. I sold it in 2010. It was due June of 2011. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> A short nine years later. Uh, <laughs> and I couldn't, I mean, I just could not. It's the same with now. It's like everything that I think that I should be able to do, it just takes you 10, 15 times longer. And that is just the fucking reality and it is so hard to accept that i feel like i literally have to go through like a, like the stages of acceptance every day with this of grief over like what i feel like i should be able to do versus what i'm actually able to do and it's quite limited especially when it comes to like talking when i'm well talking is the easiest thing for me to do when i'm unwell i can't do this but when I'm well, talking is quite easy. And then the next thing is, is working on the computer. And it's very difficult. Like I have, a, I have just a really limited period of time. And when I was writing the book, this is different. So in, in the meantime, I finally got an ileostomy because I had, so this for your audience, I had my colon stopped working because of the injury I initially sustained. It just completely stopped working and I had to take just a tremendous amount of laxative to empty the bowel so that it wasn't the colon wasn't pressing down on my extremely inflamed and damaged pelvic nerves so that was like the problem I was always dealing with and it was meant that I was in a bathroom like running back and forth to the bathroom from like 6 a.m until like at least 2 p.m every day for over a decade and so but also the morning is like when my brain is the most functional especially for focusing on writing and so the entirety of this book was written with me like waking up and like writing a little bit and then like running to the bathroom and coming back and then like, writing a little bit and just like over and over and over again and it was just like so crazy and so difficult and was like I would describe it to my mom I'm like it's like trying to like do a painting but like you can just do like the one brush stroke then you have to like run to the bathroom throw up <laughs> come back and like just do one more brush stroke and like it just takes forever and it's insane and it's like but that's what that's how it got done and it just took me an incredibly incredibly long time like like now you know this very unfortunate timing that the book just came out and a lot of because it just kind of got washed away a little bit by the pandemic and and but everybody they said to me they're like don't worry you just write another book and I'm like I can't what this one took almost 15 <laughs> years to write like I'm not gonna write another book like I mean maybe I will but it won't be what are you Stephen book. King I mean. <laughs> and so, I mean some people yeah I think are very prolific I don't know very many chronically ill people who are super super prolific like uh, unless it's like about chronic illness and they're blogging or something about that. I know some people, but even I, I can't do that. It's, I, it is very difficult for me to focus and to work on something and get it to the level that I want it to be at just artistically. Like it just takes just an inordinate amount of time and I don't know, it sucks. <laughs> but how did you stay like focused? Like how were you able to continue a thread while you're doing one brush stroke? brush stroke I'm doing great brush stroke at a time yeah I mean it was really hard like it always felt I you know this is I think true for writers in general it's just compounded a hundred times over by being sick um I really think that like the stress of writing a book is hard to understand unless you've written a book it's like and I think it's because it's more information than you can all hold in your mind at the same time like it's not Go ahead. I mean, I could not. I couldn't. Parenting with chronic illness? Yeah. I mean. um, honestly, uh, so I didn't, really didn't have a choice. Um, when I, I got pregnant very, I was told I could never have children. Mm -hmm. So when I got pregnant with my son, I was very young, like not Lifetime TV young, but 
Silicon Valley teenage mother young, like mm-hmm. early 20s. So it was like shocking. And it was not, I just graduated from college. It was very surprising. So I didn't really get like that moment to make a decision. And um, I didn't know what I had until I was 36. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've been six since I was eight and I wasn't diagnosed till I was 36. Mm-hmm. So um, I didn't really get to make a lot of choices on all of that. Um, but I also have to say, I don't know how you all do it without kids. I really mm-hmm. don't. I, I have no idea. Um, and not to say go have babies, like, <laughs> please don't take it that way. <laughs> like, it's, um, it, it is uh, definitely something that, that's a, a something that should be choice and decided and um, mm-hmm. wanted. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I don't, my kids are, <laughs> they're like my absolute joy, like, and mm-hmm. they are so, uh, so helpful. Like, mm-hmm. they, uh, they, my son will make me dinner if I can't get up. Mm-hmm. My, um, they do a lot of the, the household stuff. Um, They'll take me for walks when I can. It's kind of the family joke. Mm-hmm. And um, even when they were really little, like toddlers, like when I get really sick and I couldn't move out of bed, my daughter would call them the darling slug days. So we would watch, you know, like she was like two to like four years old and this would happen a lot. And so we would just curl up in bed together. We watched Jane Austen movies and mm-hmm. we would like do arts and crafts in bed and um Amazing. We'd read stories. Yeah. And um, my son, I was a single mom. And when he was two, I had to have massive surgery where I couldn't leave my bed. So uh-huh. I gave him the first like digital camera that existed <laughs> uh-huh. because I couldn't chase after a toddler and I was all on my own. And yeah. he would just talk the whole time he was photographing. So I'd know exactly what he was doing uh-huh. and what he was into. And then he would come back and show me all the photos. So that's kind of how we got through those first two weeks when I couldn't leave the bed with the toddler. <laughs> um, so that's compared to with chronic illness is basically hilarious weird wild and (laughs) oddly wonderful and amazing and it really kind of makes very empathetic kids like psychotically empathetic and um I have seen that with a lot able to do things like they can do stuff for themselves they're pretty Mm -hmm. self-directed that's good it's it's um I've been very lucky (laughs) they are wonderful humans (laughs) Yeah, yeah. that's not to say that they don't drive me to the edge of sanity there are definitely yeah. the like thumb on Louise give me a bottle of wild turkey and let's just like point the car towards Mexico there are those days yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. most of the time 99 percent, yeah. it's the best thing ever yeah oh, and <laughs> that, that, that's my little yeah parenting chronic illness thing mm-hmm. um but I, I'm so stuck on like um I'm sorry this is a very selfish that. No, this is just such a selfish question um, on my part because I, I've been writing a novel forever and mm-hmm. I am just, I'm doing something very similar. It's like one brush stroke mm-hmm. and that's it. And I don't know how to continue the thread. Like, how do you, how do you keep that thread strong? I'm like trying to think of how to like give in any way a satisfying answer to this. I oh, and no worries. Like, if you can't, I mean, Neil Gaiman has the best answer, which is you sit and you write. Yeah, it and then you do it again. And it's like, that is the most helpful and unhelpful answer ever. <laughs> Honestly, that is like how it was. I literally felt like it would never, ever, 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 ever be done until the moment it was done. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm never doing that again. That I sounds like that labor. Was... That absolutely sounds like labor. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And it just took, I mean, for it to be like that for so long, like it. I have to say like it was very unpleasant people are like well you've got the dream job I'm like fuck you and I just, it's not, <laughs> it does not feel like that it is so difficult like it's sorry I just like it doesn't I, it might feel differently if I wasn't in horrific pain and my brain worked better and like you know all you know it didn't have all these other problems it might feel and I know regular writers really struggle with writing as well but I it's definitely harder obviously if you've got all these physical problems as well um so yeah I don't think of writing in any way as like a glamorous thing like I found it very 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 hard and was just so relieved when it was over um and yeah (laughs) so I don't know but in terms of practically speaking you know the book I'm sure you noticed is kind of written in sort of a weird way like it's got a lot of really short sections and like the paragraphs are spaced weirdly like there's like a lot of spacing and part of that is because 
that helped me to just like focus on one thing at a time. Like there would never be, is your kid right there? <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I broke up the, the, the style that I ended up writing in, like just became like my quote style of writing, but it's not as, it's not like an aesthetic choice. It's like, a, it's, it literally is like breaks everything up so that I can focus on like small chunks easier and like make them, I think that this is actually the answer to your question is that that like by breaking things up and not having super long paragraphs and not also not having like paragraphs that are like smushed together, like there's all spacing between everything that would allow me to like just work on a little tiny section at a time and then and feel like it was really done and that it like sort of rhythmically like moved and could be and would work one to the next to the next to the next instead of having to like think about something in like two bit a chunk because I just can't focus on that much material at the same time so I just focused on little little pieces and then would string them all together and then that's fantastic advice yeah. that's very um of Scott Fitzgerald where he would uh, stop in the middle of a sentence he would never finish his last sentence so he could pick yeah. it up again it's funny you said that though because I really thought that you had made a stylistic choice in your book because it felt very much like the descent like the yeah I mean it is, it is also, I shouldn't have said it's not it's not aesthetic it is partially that like it like it, it, it just it sort of evolved as like this thing that I needed and then and then it sort of became a thing that I liked and was like, oh, I'm going to do this because I like it and I can use it, yes, to like mirror the descent and I can use it to, to, to like make it sound, I don't know, like I want it to sound like I live, I don't know, whatever I'm writing. No, like, you I'm, did that, like, and also as like, you know, all of my other health issues, um, I have the ADHD of a gnat with a cocaine issue. So mm -hmm. it was, um, it was deeply easy for me to read as well. So I think for like your I, audience, who's most likely chronic illness, that's a super easy book to read. Yes, no, but that, that, so this is important. <laughs> my publisher asked me at the very last minute to take the spacing, the weird spacing stuff out. And they sent no. me a bunch of drafts without that, and not drafts, galleys without that and I was like what <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like that's not the book that I wrote it's and we've been working together for 11 years now <laughs> like this is not like a surprise that I write this way like you know that I write in this style you, we're not doing it this way and that we had a huge argument back and forth about this and in the end I was just like it has to be this other way sure stylistically for me but I am 100% sure that people like me need it to be in this digestible mm -hmm. way because it makes it much easier to read, which is part of why I wrote it that way. It made it easier to write. And so it has to stay this way. Like if you don't publish it this way, I'm going to release it in a Word document for people to read that need it in this other way because it just has to be that way. It mirrors the way that our brain works. And that matters to me and to the readers. Well, if they care at all what the reader who is chronic illness thinks, I, I wouldn't have been able to read it a different I'm way. Gonna, I'm going to excerpt this and be like... You can <laughs> excerpt this and send it over to them and be like, this, I'm this totally is exactly yeah. why I was right. But yeah. that also comes to the point of like when the decision makers aren't the people who are experiencing it. We've seen this a lot in movies of like the White Savior movies of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, or the... Um, there's a lot of movies that have been made in the last, even up to the last three years that were um, decision makers of the the story weren't the people who experienced it and mm -hmm. it gets the story gets very muddled and the way it gets presented gets very convoluted where then mm -hmm. you have things like um black panther come out where it's like mm -hmm. oh, this is a new story or orthodox which i don't know if you've gone been. down that rabbit hole but oh it was good yeah and they had people in that community make the decisions mm -hmm. and that's yeah. um i think it's important that you, you were able to, to fight that. for that <laughs> you yeah. have to do that it is it's like so obvious yeah it happened in Coco I remember too like they like started making Coco that Disney movie and like it was just I love that movie like I know and they start but the first version of that movie was just like a bunch of white people in Hollywood like working on it and they were like somebody somebody in the team was just like this is wrong <laughs> this is terrible and then they just redid it, and had it I think that's what Book of the Dead became right as they, they had two movies that came out at the same time where it was Book of the Dead which was oh, very yeah, yeah, yeah stand it it was not mm. yeah. and then there was coco <laughs> and you can just tell it's like it, it 
and it's obvious of course it should be written from the perspective of the people that are like that's their story and so yeah. anyway, so in this case it's the same it's the same thing and I, I I'm very grateful that they that they, in the end they they agreed to let it be I am too. And I also think that the caregivers who read this or the people who are just curious what life is like, this is an easier book to read, Rich. You know, like mm -hmm. when you have the story makers who are supposed to be telling your story their way, it, it becomes a better story for everyone to read yeah. or to watch or to experience. Yeah. Well, and that was also one of the other reasons that it took so long is that it's really, it's easier to write something that is not easy to read <laughs> like it is easy to write badly and like not edited and like one of the things that took me forever was making it as like tight and quick fast paced as possible and so like it reads fast but making for me making something read fast takes a really 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 long time and so it doesn't and it doesn't feel like that I know that like there are books when I read it I'm like just like blazing through it and I have to remind myself that like it was probably difficult for that person to write. It didn't just like all come out in a torrent, but it doesn't feel that way when you're, when you're reading it. It's like, but I do think I, that was like very, very top of mind for me was like, this book must not be difficult to read because it is a bunch of people with like broken brains, essentially not, not broken, <laughs> but like, uh, and it's a very difficult subject. It is painful and triggering and dense. And so if it's not, written in a way that's like really light it is never ever going to be read like it will just sink to the bottom of the ocean and like so that was really important for me but but I think definitely made it take a lot longer to to produce because it for me that that does take a long time to make something move quickly I love watching um the YouTube interviews with authors just to kind of get their process down and like Erin Morgenstern is one of my favorite people uh, she wrote Night Circus and then she just wrote Starless Sea I don't know if you read those but they're they're super I fun Circus I've not read it <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah and That's I have not fair. read the Star Starless Sea <laughs> but she talked about how um is it was eight years between her books mm -hmm. uh and like Night Circus came out it was this big deal and everyone was like next one mm -hmm. next one and like yeah, it's yeah, this yeah, like nice. we're like we've never been worse at this than right now, but we're always entertainment locusts. Yeah. Like we go through like something that took someone like ten years to do, or like you know years and years of like multiple people to create a TV show. We're like, it's been two months. We're season yeah, two. We're, <laughs> like, no, I know. I know. It's uh, it's tough. I've been having a lot of that. They're like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And I'm like, <laughs> just leave me alone. Just breathing. Breathing's yeah. the next thing. <laughs> Yeah. Oxygen. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had also talked about gardening, which is like my deep passion in life. <laughs> One of them. Yes, gardening. It's just what people said it would be. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so fun and like rewarding and stress relieving. And I, so I have never been a gardener. I, well, I planted a little garden once way back. Uh, but yeah, this year, <laughs> so I just moved into this new place in Washington, D.C. that has on the roof, it's not a community garden, it's not like big, it's not like big raised beds, but it's like, a, I would say half the building has little like container garden plots up there. And so it's like this Eden of like container garden flowers and vegetables, and it's just so beautiful up there. And so this year, since it's my first summer here, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to get really into it. And then it became clear that the pandemic was, was coming and was not going. <laughs> and so I went to the, to the hardware store and I like bought so many seeds and like seed, you know, those pellets and all this stuff. And they were like, sweetie, you are not going to have time to do all of this. And I was like, I don't think you're watching the news. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I think I am, <laughs> and I I was right, <laughs> and so now I've got this very elaborate garden growing. It's mostly just seeds, and it's just starting to grow at this point. But it's very fun. What's it. the crop you're looking forward to the most? Um, so I'm growing. Well, I will be growing uh, cucumbers. I just I have got some rows of lettuce going. I've got cucumber seedlings, which I think is a, I started a little early because I don't know. 
anything about anything. <laughs> um, and then I've got all the, I've got this very extensive flower garden seed. I'm looking at them now as like a grow house over there. <laughs> Seedling bed of like zinnias and cosmos and delphinium and lupin and is it lupin or lupine? I've always gone with lupin, but I'm famous lupin. for mispronouncing. <laughs> I am so good at mispronouncing. <laughs> I think podcasts are so funny for that because every podcaster I know like like reveals like what the word that they don't know like <laughs> how to say and like because they so hear many. all of a sudden like yeah you're just talking and people lots of people are hearing you and get feedback it's so funny I love, I love okay like hearing. what a story this is like my family story so you know how, like every family has like the one story that they will try out to humiliate you with like for my mom it's that she tormented my hamster with a vacuum cleaner <laughs> for and she also tried to resuscitate a hamster with cpr that's like the big family story for her she actually like cpr to hamster mm -hmm. um hers for mine is that i saw suede and i instantly thought it would be pronounced sude so <laughs> that is like the family joke that she trots out every time she wants oh. to like Tick me off. No. No. <laughs> yeah. So yes, that's that's my my Achilles heel is today. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. We all have them. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, lots of flowers, some vegetables, very elaborate herb garden. It's it's really good. I feel really really good about it. Um, and there's like the studies that say that like having our hands in soil actually helps our microbiome. Exactly. Exactly. And I think just having something to work on that is for me, because I do so much work like on the computer, just like fending off email and social media and like all this stuff. And I just hate all of it. I hate computers. <laughs> I'm like extremely <laughs> phobic and anti technology. And just because it gives me, I can physically feel it in my body like it just I, I don't have any judgment about it for other people it's just me like for me personally it really I hate it and uh and so when I'm working in a garden it's just like all of that is gone and like my whole body relaxes but it's also productive it's like something is actually happening I'm doing a thing it's creating a thing I can see the results of that thing it's nice <laughs> um, they're saying about nurturing and taking care of something that I exactly. think is healing exactly and it's yummy and yeah, with food exactly. stability issues it's also really nice just to have like and you can do it anywhere in like with any budget like I was just finishing up a book a children's book and like even with takeout containers you can just put some holes on the bottom of it put some yeah. soil in put your seeds in and then take the plastic and plastic and put it over that and then that's yes, a greenhouse yeah. like yeah but there is Another, uh, I'm not into like silver linings, as you know, but one thing that I do think is positive <laughs> coming out of this nightmare that we're in right now is that there's a lot of that happening. There's like a ton of like victory gardens and people are learning mm. to get their food. And obviously that's not going to like overhaul the way our food system or anything like that. But but I think it, 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 there's, I don't know, there are these cracks that are opening up that it's like, I don't know, maybe... Maybe things will, some good stuff will come out of this. That would be. That'd be nice. Which isn't to say, well, I'm so glad this happened. I'm not saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, you can see the, that there are some, some things that could, could change really for the better, which would be great. Lovely. Yeah. I'm okay with silver linings as long as I'm the one who came up with them. <laughs> if it's about my life, I'm okay with, if I have a silver <laughs> lining that I found for me, I'm yeah. good with it, but you don't get to make that silver lining for me. No one else gets to tell me what my silver lining is. Like that's exactly it. It is exactly okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. You are allowed to come up with your own silver lining, for your own life, but nobody else is allowed to say like, "Well, but on, have you thought about on the?" Podcast? <laughs> Someone has a plan for you. <laughs> like, mm, no, <laughs> more enraging than somebody else telling you like. How to make the best of your situation, especially because it's really true that those people are just two seconds away from pivoting to complaining about their own stuff. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you just said that my tragedy was been... <laughs> like, yeah, it's it, it drives me completely, completely insane. The the incessant need to bright side somebody else's Horrible, horrible life like why why do people have to do that yeah. I mean there's I, I understand the need to 
mirror. Like there's that need to say like, I empathize with you, like, or I get you. And like, there's, I think, it, uh, I mean, I don't know for everyone, but I think like, really a lot of people come to a place of like, I just want you to see me and know that I see you. And, and this is how I'm doing this. It's like, we need to have a better way to do that. Like just hold space for someone. Yeah, like, I think most people don't know how to hold space or think that like looking on the bright side is an act of service. They're like trying to help you make it better. And it's like, and I just think that people don't realize that it really, really <laughs> does not make it better to do that to somebody else and just don't do it. Just do not do it. And yeah, just just learn to be there and mirror somebody and, and hold space with them and just be with them in the shit. Like that is so healing to just have somebody else say, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry and this sucks and I don't know how you do it I admire you the end like that's like so yeah. if like everyone could just learn to just do that as a default like that would be so much better than like you know well I hear what you're saying but have you thought about how you know your book coming out in a pandemic <laughs> could be really really positive if you just think about it and don't think about it <laughs> have you had to comfort someone else after you told them your story oh it's everybody <laughs> 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 I just had to talk my mail lady down from a ledge because she saw me like out with my cane and I, she wants to know what's wrong. She's like, oh, I hope you feel better. And I was in a snarky ass mood as I usually am. I was like, yeah, that doesn't happen with DNA issues. Like <laughs> this is permanent. So I just kind of gave her like the basics. Like my joints fall out of socket all the time. I have mass dislocations. This is how this is. And she almost started crying and I had to spend 10 extra minutes standing up to comfort this poor woman. I'm like, I should have just said, thank you. I should have said, yes, I hope I get better soon too. Like that would have been such a time saver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very real. It, that, that's been one of the things that's been the hardest about releasing the book is that it's like a lot of people that I know pretty well that didn't know a lot of this stuff. Cause I don't, I am not somebody that I just, I hate social media. So like I don't post stuff about <laughs> anything on the internet it has nothing to do with like sharing versus not sharing. I just, it, I tell people if I'm talking to them but I don't post stuff on, on the internet. And so, so a lot of people didn't know. And so a lot of people's response was to feel very, very, very guilty and would call and talk to me about like how bad they felt but not in a way that was like but it was for me to to make them feel better and I was like oh gosh <laughs> I get it but like I just I yeah but but it but that really does fall into the category of like I'm 100% sure that like I have done that and in the wrong way with some other person dealing with a difficult thing or, or grief that i if their husband died or something, I just feel sure, I don't know what it was, but I feel sure that I probably did the wrong thing that falls into this type of category of if you're in that, if it's happened to you, you are very aware of this is the wrong thing that people do over and over again, but they don't know that. And so, so that's, so I, I'm just bringing it up to say it's very difficult, but I also am like, I get it. Like mm -hmm. nobody knows what to do and we're all <laughs> kind of do the wrong thing all the time, but still, man, it's really hard to make, to take care of other people that are having trouble carrying your <laughs> difficult thing that you have to take care of them in that difficulty that's tough <laughs> i i'm a, a coward i write fiction so i get to hide everyone in character names how did you <laughs> feel writing like you didn't name your doctors i'm assuming that's a legal choice um but how did you feel like actually writing people yeah it, not, not just a legal choice i i i don't I would never, I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't want to like hurt somebody. The, uh, these people that hurt me horribly, <laughs> I don't, I am not interested in like, you know, making their lives worse. I just don't, I don't want to do that. But I, it just, I don't know, it just, yeah, it doesn't feel right. But writing about, I, I did. <laughs> That, that said, I feel very interested. I think about this all the time, <laughs> that I do kind of want to send all of these people the book with like a little post-it note, like on their scene that just says like, you. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> that's it. And because like, that feels like enough. Like that Please. feels like, 
that's just and that's it with no letter with no nothing that's just like that or maybe a letter that's just a little more generous than that that's just like because a lot of these people as I say in the book for a variety of reasons the main one being like you do not have the um luxury of like talking back to these people because you kind of need them and like even if you don't see them again you don't want them to be against you what if you have to have a doctor you're seeing now get in touch with that person in the future or whatever or what if you need pain meds and it's on your record that you're drug seeking yeah exactly and so like you cannot you know I feel like so many different people in society that are marginalized or have no power deal with this all the time it's like you really do need to like be able to have anger and to to talk back and to be a squeaky wheel, but like you can't because it is going to boomerang back on you. And like that is just fucked up and unfair and wrong. And so, the, but it's the reality. And so for a lot of these doctors, or it's just like too much energy and like you just, you have to like take up your energy just living your life. And so you don't have time to like go correct a doctor in their bad behaviors after the fact. And so a lot of the doctors that I saw, I think, I I feel sure that even though my experience with them was like horrifically traumatic, that they don't think of it that way, that they were just like, yeah, that was a difficult procedure, but like, I never heard from her again. And I, you know, she was probably doing okay. You know, like that probably means she's doing okay. I know that that's true because I've gone back to see doctors I didn't see for a long time. And they're like, you know, I've thought about you, like, low these many years and like I've been hoping that you like that it all got sorted out and that you were okay and and obviously it wasn't but they didn't know that you know they just there's no the way that the medical system is set up is like you just once they're out of your office like that's it they're gone and and so I think that a lot of these doctors there is no feedback mechanism except those fucking surveys that they send you now constantly which I think is a good step in the right direction but I I don't know about you. I feel afraid to send those out because I'm like, I do not believe that that they're totally anonymous and that that person is like, because I'm like, oh, this is good. Like I could give the feedback that I always felt like I couldn't give, but I'm like afraid to because I'm worried that the same reasons that they're that it's gonna they're gonna be like, oh, I know who this is, and I'm now gonna treat them poorly in the future. Anyway, that's just a side. No, that's that's. I I feel like when you're in a bad medical relationship it is like being an abused kid or being an abused spouse or in a, it's a very abusive power structure because it's very authoritarian the doctor has all to say there is no one to go around to like you can but no I mean there's you have to sue and that's a long and expensive process and it's very hard to prove and it's a it's a dangerous system <laughs> set up but um I don't know if you know the yellow wallpaper story, the woman who wrote it, she wrote it because it was her experience Mm -hmm. in um, post childbirth and like the Victorian era. And or maybe it's early, I'm sorry, the hemp brain is on fried, but it was, uh, um, she gave it to her doctor who had prescribed for her to be left in a small room after her child was born. She was suffering from um, uh, depression and just given milk and porridge and no books and no writing materials and she could she wasn't allowed to write or see anyone there was supposed to the maid was supposed to enter silently leave her food and go and this is for months and that but that short story is one of the best short stories about if you want to know how to write insanity like a, a slow descent that's a great story and um she gave it to her doctor when she finished it and he changed his medical practices and started to educate other doctors because he was like, I had no idea. I thought I was doing the right thing for her. Like this is obviously the wrong way to go. Yeah. That's actually the most, for me, the most heartening response that I've gotten from like a lot of readers is that they've sent it on to like their primary care doctor or to their therapist or something like that, but especially to doctors. And I've heard from a lot of doctors that I'm very glad to hear from other mommies and other patients like that is that's, that's important. But it's it's almost more important that it be given to physicians because like that's where the breakdown is like that is where like the most because I really do believe like obviously the illness is the this family of illnesses is horrible and tragic and just the experience of it is the worst. I really believe that the abusive relationship between you and like a thousand doctors that you are forced to see is 
worse than the illness itself. It has been for me. Like it just is so, it just, it, it, it's so painful. It is so emotionally painful to be treated that way over and over and over and over and over again. It is abusive. And it's just that, and that part is totally fixable. Like that, there is nothing that needs to happen that's difficult um, for doctors to change those around. I'm very loud skateboarder just for me. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so so I really do, that's one thing that I, I hope for a lot is just being able to like speak to as many physicians as possible to be able to do, um, like I talked to George Washington University about doing like grand rounds there and like just, just going in to just be like, I don't, I, I know that you know me. I know that you know people like me, patients like me. I know that this is a recognizable phenomenon. I need you to, to hear the story from our side and what it actually is like, what it is like to work with you, the doctor, and how it, the simplest things that you could change to just believe us and just, even if you don't know what to do, to just say, I believe you. I know that this type of illness is horrible and I'm going to do my best to try to find you the most supportive team, you know, in DC or whatever it is. That's it. That's like, if, they, if, they, if you could just change that, I just feel like that is like a huge step forward for this community of patients that is, because to add that type of psychological suffering on top of the physical suffering is just so... Uh, unconscionable to me like it's just wrong like if you did that to a different type of illness you would have your medical license taken away like if you treated patients with cancer the way that you're treating this type of patient you would definitely be stripped of your license and so it's it just it, it just that is the one thing that is it's like doesn't take years of research and billions of funding and like that it's it could change tonight it could change by tomorrow you know so. compassion <laughs> we could just embrace compassion yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, and just being able to reflect on yourself. I really think that, that is part of it, is like knowing that that is part of your duty as somebody with a lot of power that is charged with somebody else's life. You have to be able to be self-reflective and like evaluating if you're doing the best by your, your patients and being willing to change. And that, that has been a quality that I, it's been hard to come by. <laughs> Um, it's a rare and beautiful quality um i've kidnapped you for two hours so far yeah we're not. I <laughs> so don't know you need to to go <laughs> I, I i just want to ask one last question before i let you go and uh first off darn you for slate i i went on to slate and um i know i'm gonna lose the rest of the day looking at slate the podcasting app that mm -hmm. was way too much fun but have you caught up with outlander oh yes i think <laughs> It's, uh, that just made me feel like I'm like, is there more? Out there? <laughs> <That was laughs> the There's time. like one more episode left, and I'm like freaking oh, out oh, because no, 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 no. It's the new, or is it season five? Is it like the new? Yeah. No, I am not cut up, so I'm waiting for it. To <gasps> I will not say anything else. Never mind. I was gonna like freak out and fangirl with you, but no, I, I will not say anything about season five. Except the only thing I will say is this season is my favorite. <gasps> <laughs> like it was my like hands down like they lost me a little bit with like it, yeah. I felt like it jumped the shark for a second and yeah. I was like this is yeah. getting ridiculous come on now yeah like when they I made mean, 20 years with like one gray hair <laughs> oh my god yes <laughs> <laughs> oh yes Jamie is so old yes you 60 year old men have six packs that's how that works out <laughs> sure in the American frontier no missing <laughs> not a single I mean, pimple to be had <laughs> I've never, I know, I mean, people get aged up all the time on TV and they just <laughs> didn't do it. <laughs> I know Claire has this one beautiful strip of so her really white hair. And you're like, oh my God, she, yeah. I, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why that was not? Funny. That was such a funny decision. I was like, I mean, they are beautiful. I don't mind looking at them. No problems with the beauty forever. there. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can watch that show for a myriad of reasons. Um, yeah, that's one of the only shows I've ever rewatched the whole the whole thing. I went through last year. I just rewatched everything. It was so good. It's I I love the writer like um, Diana. Oh gosh, brain. Gabaldon. Gab yeah. Gab there's like there's one YouTube video I've watched like twenty times, and it was called Rulers of the Realm, and it was George R. R. Martin, uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, Diana, um, 
uh, and uh, Lev Grossman and Pierce something, but they talked about writing. And it was one of the best discussions about how to write I've ever heard in my life. And her oh, cool. advice was like, like her 10 minutes should just be like highlighted and put mm -hmm. all over YouTube on like how you oh. handle writer's block. I was like, this is, this is good. <laughs> I have to look at up. What kind of fiction do you write? I write, um, well, I write a few different things. I, um, I run a whole another publishing company uh, for children's picture books. So I write and illustrate oh. kids' books. Um, and then I run another podcast for kids. I do a history podcast called I Can't Believe That Happened. It's like 10 minute, like weird stuff that happened in history that you're like, I should have known about that. Like, oh. yeah, I'm doing a whole season on the history of robots, which actually started in ancient Greece. Oh. There were robots in ancient Greece. And in the Middle Ages, we're like, it was huts and Robin Hood. Robin Hood was the big advancement. It's like, no, 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 no. Um, the Muslim world had robots. They actually had robots, real, I mean, for real, what we recognize as a programmable robot. There was an engineer called Al Jazari who invented these amazing robots that you could actually have cam systems that were like these little wheels that you would insert into these robot musicians to play different music. And it wasn't just like a sound playing, oh they would play. So it's like really cool stuff. And like, I feel like I should have heard about that. <laughs> so I do that. And then I'm, um, I'm writing a, a fantasy novel that I guess is kind of why just cause the protagonist is a teenage girl, but it's really kind of touching on this idea of like, what actually are we? And mm -hmm. can you recoup what you've lost? Like, mm. is there a way to get that back? And can you recognize it if it doesn't look like what you thought it should look like? Mm. So yeah, those are like, I, I have no tolerance for boredom. I, 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 I am like this psychotic, like screwed up idea of like, let's put all the energy of like some sort of like dark supernova into the body that's failing. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's very messed up to be like stuck when you're like, but that shiny idea and that shiny idea. It's like the Mad Hatter and Alice in Wonderland where it's like, it's so crowded up here. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, frustrating, yeah. but lots to do. <laughs> yeah. That's cool though. I have to look that, um, that writing's conversation up. That sounds good. I will send you, I will, I'll, I'll email it over to you when we're done talking, but yeah, thank you. I, I will let you go say, I think you're probably getting tired and I need to take my pain meds pretty soon because yeah. I'm going to start whimpering and that's never anything anyone wants to hear, <laughs> but that's, I can't thank you enough for letting me, this will um, come out in two parts. Um, okay. But I, um, I'm really grateful you decided to let me chat with you and Kidef you for this uh, long. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's so nice meeting you. It's nice talking to you. It's really a pleasure. So thank you. Well, thank you. Well, everyone, um, head over to Invisible Not Broken and top of show notes. Please buy the book. It's um, it's absolutely one of my favorites. And I'm not usually a memoir person. And um, I actually usually don't even accept books from publishers. This was uh, one that I just couldn't resist. And um, so I'm really, really happy to hear from you. Um, I think next week is probably Eva. So until next week, be kind, be gentle, and in whatever way it looks like to you, be a badass. Off the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
enjoying this podcast and Eva's podcast. Um, if you need more of us, head over to our Facebook group. That's been really active and it's becoming a really beautiful community. So a great place to go and tell us uh, what you think or what you want more of or just to hang out and chat with us. If you also want some more, we have a blog and you can head over to our website, invisiblenotbroken.com. Kindest thing you can do for us is we have a Patreon account. This is all done out of Eva in my pocket. So if you want to support us, that'd be really great. That's just not in your budget. Um, the next best, most wonderful thing you can do is leave a really embarrassingly nice review on Apple Podcasts. Hit subscribe and share these episodes with your friends and with your community. That'd be amazing. And we are so grateful for that. We are completely advertised through your word of mouth. So thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Be kind, be gentle, and it's never been more important in whatever way you can be a badass.